So something for people to digest whilst they're popping their names in the chat. And we're just getting ready to start. We're already up to 85 participants, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm hoping some people who attended the Tuesday session found it useful enough to return tonight. So, you know, let's hope some of you are returnees. Uh, I will apologise before we get there that some slides will be a, a little similar as we are recapping and overlearning uh, with you on, on some of the things we've covered. But we're very conscious that some people were only able to attend this session. So we just want to make sure we cover everybody. OK, next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, there will be a little bit of repetition. Hopefully there's some new stuff that you haven't heard before. Um, we said last time, none of this is really rocket science. We want it to be really practical. We are focused here on real teachers in real classrooms. And uh, we want to make sure that whatever it is you learn today, you can actually sort of implement <laughs> or certainly from the eighth when everybody is now back in school. Next slide, please. So these are the objectives for Nason and Whole School Send. Um, and what I won't be covering today in any detail is how to use the chat and the question and answers. I'm just going to mention here that, um, you know, obviously people have found the chat because you're putting lots of information in there, which is great. Um, and if you've got questions, if you could pop them in the Q&A section, that just makes it really easy for us to find them and make sure we answer your questions as they arise. So thanks ever so much for that. That's really helpful. Next slide. But just a reminder about what high quality teaching is, as we said on uh, Tuesday, it's also known as wave one teaching or quality first teaching. But uh, for the reasons explained, we're sticking with high quality teaching because we want it to be quality throughout, not just at first. It is very much the universal offer for all children, all schools, academies, early years, right through to further education. And the idea is that if we can meet the needs of most people within our universal offer, there'll be less people who require that targeted support. And then of course, those small minority of young people who require that truly specialist support. Our ambition is to sort of help people to meet the needs of every child in their class. And we're recognizing that learners with SEND and are a significant minority, three to four children in every mainstream class. So everybody will be experienced in working with SEND learners. So in that, every teacher is a teacher of SEND and we are really passionate about helping and supporting people around the country, uh, not just in Lancashire, West Yorkshire, which is where we're based, to be a teacher of SEND. So, as we said earlier, if we can just get the universal offer right, we can really start to meet need and make sure that our minimal sort of resource that we have available for targeted and specialist is focused on the right children all of the time. Next slide, please. This is a lovely visual which I have stolen from Nicole. So um, I, I do sort of uh, fully accept that we're all magpies and the best sort of ideas always come from someone else. But what we're hoping to do with you, both in Tuesday's webinar and tonight, is to help you to clear that path for your children in your class and make sure that they are all able to be included and to achieve their full potential. <coughs> Next slide. But just a little bit of a reminder because we tend to focus in on the school section of the code of practice which is chapter six but this is just a reminder that actually high quality teaching 
and that differentiated and personalized teaching is actually mentioned really early on in the code of practice in section one, but also that need for the progressive removal of barriers so that we're constantly looking at what we're doing and removing barriers over time to increase participation in our mainstream education. Next slide. We're on a real delay with the slides, it's sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> it just it takes a moment, so I do apologise if there's this, this sort of pause whilst I wait for the slide to change. So this is a slide, another stolen slide. This one's come from Malcolm, Malcolm Reeve, who's, who's our, one of our national leaders with Nason Hill School Send. And this is Malcolm's handy reference slide. So this is there to help you understand how the sort of broad areas of need, the four broad areas of need, which are at the bottom there, pan out in terms of percentages. This is national data. Somebody asked me that question the other day. So not just specific to Lancashire and West Yorkshire, but what we find if we drill into the regions is the pattern is very, very similar. So we've got these key five areas coming out of specific learning difficulties, moderate learning difficulties, social, emotional, mental health, speech language communication needs and autistic spectrum disorder. So there's a little bit of a, a sort of key at the side of it. And if you keep this slide somewhere, it's a nice thing to sort of have in a file somewhere or on your wall, just to help you remember what the types of need are. Next slide. And here we've got the breakdown in the primary and the secondary phase. So you can see that in primary schools, the primary need, the most predominant need is communication interaction, followed quite closely by cognition and learning and then social, emotional, mental health. Whereas for the secondary phase, cognition and learning is higher at 40%, communication interaction at 22.7, SEMH 20%. So it's always interesting to see that over that six weeks, we start to uh, sort of address needs differently. We start to see needs in different ways and we need to sort of improve the way that we uh, catch up. We've quickly, rapidly, whip through those slides there. So <laughs> I think all we were going to say on that one was what we've tried to do is plan this high quality teaching and learning so that we cover the most prominent area of need. So by sort of attending these sessions, by sort of using these strategies in your day-to-day -day practice, you can cover 70% of the needs of children with SEND in your classes. And we think that if you're doing that and you're doing it really well, you're doing a fantastic job. So in these very challenging times, as we all face sort of COVID and you know, who knows what the brave new world's gonna look like from the eighth, um, we would really commend these ideas to you and we hope that you're gonna find it really useful. Next slide. <clears throat> Somebody's just asking if they can access the Tuesday recording. Of course you can, that will be available. And the PowerPoint, you know, will, that goes with that is also available. So we're going to be focusing in on communication and interaction and ASD, also known as ASC, autism, autism related conditions. Um, you know, the, these strategies will work for all of those areas. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'm going to hand over now to Nicole, um, who is going to talk to you about her slides. She's got some fantastic images here, which we're hoping really help people to understand sort of what we mean when we talk about this universal offer and inclusion. Uh, Nicole is a practicing SENCO, but also head of SEND for Dixon's Academy Trust. And um, she will be able to provide you with lots of practical advice, which are things that she's using in the classroom and with her staff as we speak. Uh, we've also got James Pidcock with us tonight and uh, James will be uh, sort of sharing the other half of the slide so it's sort of split in, in half um, and James is um, both a former deputy of a PRU so has a real sort of understanding of behaviour and how uh, behaviour can impact on learning and he is also very experienced in mainstream secondary, primary and special schools. So again, practical advice of things that really work and are evidence-led. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Angela. Hi, everyone, again. Um, I didn't know at the beginning when this slide came on whether you were doing a dramatic pause or whether you were waiting for me to start talking, so I'm glad I didn't jump in. I wouldn't have got an introduction. 
Um, so this is the same slide as we showed on Tuesday, but I show it to people over and over again um, at every given opportunity. I think it's really important for visualising um, what it is that we're trying to achieve for our children with additional needs. There is there is a place for fair distribution of resources, additional and different, making sure that every child gets what they need, not necessarily the same, but the specific things that they need in order to succeed and thrive. And I think we have a tendency to skip straight to the additional and different because that is that's what's come to represent send provision for us. But actually the very first step and the un, the the constant theme um, should be the removal of the systemic barriers that are preventing um, true inclusion in the first place. And this is not something that is an opinion of mine. It's not something that I've decided myself. It's right there in those quotes from the Code of Practice that Angela showed you earlier. Inclusion is about the, the progressive removal of barriers so that more and more children can be included just as the norm of what we're doing. Inclusion is a journey that we're still on and that we don't have to wait for a resource. We don't have to wait for someone to, to change something for us. This is something that is within our power and even better, it's often really simple, easy things, even reframing things that you already do just to be a little bit more considerate of the diverse range of needs that you've got. So I'll always keep coming back to this picture because I've never found anything that represents that quite so well. Next slide, please. Now I'm doing dramatic pauses. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is expand and improve our universal offer so that more and more children's needs can be met within that. That's mutually beneficial. It means that more of our children can succeed and thrive alongside one another. That's real inclusion, everyone together in the same space, doing the same thing and learning and, and going on to have great adult outcomes. Um, and it's also better for us because it means that there's less kind of additional and different planning and less to coordinate. It's just about improving our own practice so that it includes more and more children just in what we were doing anyway. That doesn't mean that some children won't need additional and different. That would be a different, a very different session. This is about those really, really simple, easy wins that can expand our universal offer so that more and more children can just be in our classrooms getting on, doing really well without the need for or without the need for additional and different so soon. Next slide, please. New content alert. Everything has been repeated so far, but I made this especially for you. I think, um, again, with our children with SEN, when they come into our classrooms, we've got a tendency to skip to what the need that's different, what the need in terms of resources, do they need a teaching assistant, do they need to go out to an intervention, but actually we've skipped some really important steps and real inclusion kind of start, starts within us. The, the very first thing that needs to be done for any child is just a change in our own attitude and our understanding of SEND. So if we've got that that self-perception that we have ownership, we have to build those relationships, we have to get to know the Senko and the children and the children's families and take them tiny little steps. No one's expecting anyone to change the world, but just something as simple as changing the phrasing of your sentence, changing the lighting in your classroom. Actually, that makes a huge difference to these children. And if everyone takes that ownership, and takes those little steps, then actually the impact, the potential impact is is huge. And again, it's nothing difficult. You don't need to buy anything. You don't need to go anywhere. It's just things that are within ourselves that we can we can start working on right now. Next slide, please. Just a little reminder, um, hopefully you found this useful, those of you that were on the call on Tuesday, but I have colour coded um, the four broad areas of need because by their very nature, these kind of um, strategies lend themselves to more than one need type. 
we are going to focus on autism and then SLCN, speech, language and communication in this session. But we'll keep the coloured dots at the corner of every slide um, so that you can see where they would potentially support a broader range of needs as well. On top of that, for most of these strategies, I would argue all of these strategies, there is not a child in your classroom that doesn't benefit. They're all just considerations, considerate actions, trying to put as many things in place that just support our students to get things right and to be able to succeed, making it easy for them to do well. And there's no one that doesn't benefit from that. You will also, I think, be able to see on each slide where we've opted out and just put all four colours, because it is really difficult sometimes to decide who isn't going to benefit. So we've tried as much as possible to highlight the main groups that will benefit. But actually, I think at least half the time we've just fully opted out and put all four colours. And that's absolutely true. There isn't a child that doesn't benefit from these strategies. And that's that's the beauty of real inclusion, really. Next slide, please. OK, so um, talking specifically about autistic spectrum conditions, for those, I don't think it's very many people, but for those of you that were not on the previous call, I will do my disclaimers, but really quickly. These are painfully simple, so I hope no one feels shortchanged. Um, if these are things that you are doing already, hopefully you find that affirming. That is really promising, and it's often just about reframing what you're already doing to recognise it as inclusive practice um, and, and something that we can feel proud of that we're already achieving. I steal everything from everywhere, including the image that Angela has so kindly credited to me. I stole that, but I can't remember where from. And that is true of pretty much all of these strategies as well. And um, I think that's it. I might think of some, some more things later. I, I have lots of confessions to make, but I think that'll do for now. So next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit of repetition. Repetition is good for everyone as well. A little bit of repetition from the previous session, but thinking specifically about autistic children, having those really predictable routines. I spoke before about the arrival slide. Again, it's using very Dixon's Trinity specific language. And if anyone finds that triggering or offensive, DM me on Twitter. It's fine, I promise it's fine. We're, we're very nice. Um, having something so that they're not wondering what's going on, they're not waiting for something to be sprung on them, they're not wondering what's going to be happening next, reduces that anxiety, feeds into that artistic preference for routine and, and sameness that they find really reassuring. When the anxiety is low they're, and they're relaxed, they're able to focus on what it is that you're actually teaching them without having to worry about kind of extraneous factors and um, facilitates more students to be successful together. There's less confusion, fewer grey areas, more opportunities to be successful and to get things right. This kind of um, covers a lot of areas. So I do always start with this very same slide in every single lesson, even with classes where there are no identified children with additional needs. No one doesn't benefit from having from knowing what's going on and being and feeling safe and secure. But I also um, try to keep the format of my lessons very similar. I also try to keep the kind of tasks we do fairly similar. And we'll come to how we can deviate from that later on in this same presentation, because of course that's not what life's like. And we also need to prepare children for change. But I've found that the better my routine, the stronger my routine, the more familiar my lessons are, the more adventurous I can be with the children because they trust me. They know what they're to expect and they know that when I say something's going to happen a certain way, that that is what is going to happen. Next slide. So as a follow on from that, obviously, we can always guarantee that things are going to follow the same routine. Our children, particularly our children with autism, have to develop coping strategies for change. They've got to become desensitised to it to an extent. Also, 
we want to be able to do exciting fun things with our children and use resources and move around and introduce them to new experiences so although i hope i'm not contradicting myself i do advocate a really strong routine we do also want to build in different activities change uh, for variety for learning experiences and for fun if you have got those strong routines, you've built that trust, then absolutely you have more scope to do this and for it to work and be successful. But you have to do it really carefully. So for me, when I've got children that I know struggle with that, and I don't wanna keep going, uh, going on about relationships, and I know James is gonna cover um, more aspects of relationships later, but it really, really does come down to having those strong relationships and knowing your kid is really, really well. Um, if you know there are children in your classes that struggle with that change, having a little word with them as they enter, say halfway through this lesson, we're going to do something a little bit different. It's going to be really fun. You're going to be super, super at it. Is the first step, we'll get a little bit of warning. Using countdowns, and again, that can be done at a whole class level, so it's not singling anyone out, but saying we're going to change this activity when I've counted down from five. Um, using lots and lots of kind of warning and reassurance and positively framing it um for some children that might not be enough and um different schools will obviously have different resources available but we have a whiteboard and whiteboard pens at every desk so i might draw a simple flow chart first we're doing our reading then we're going to go through some questions and then we're actually going to move seats and that do a little flow chart so they can keep referring back to it and i think um a key element of supporting them to cope better with change is, that's often missed is a follow-up conversation and i think in my personal experience at the end of the lesson just taking a child to one side and saying that were a really that were a really big change in this lesson and you did really really great i'm really proud of how you coped with it not going overboard they can smell a fish like anyone can smell a fish but um making sure that you've acknowledged it and reinforced because they probably are still feeling a little bit anxious about it but just reassuring them that you've noticed and that they did really well next slide please oh my goodness is that the next slide yeah okay this is repetition from the previous one but i think low arousal um approaches are particularly important for children with autism who can often um have low latent inhibition which means that they notice minor details and become fixated on them our sorry there were there were dust on the screen um they they can often kind of become preoccupied with with it aspects of your lesson or your environment that seem irrelevant to the rest of us. Um, so I think this is particularly important for our autistic children. I would always try to keep my environment really purposeful, relevant, distraction free. If anyone's been to my school, you will have noticed that it is really plain white and grey with very minimal displays and not, not much lying around. Um, that really supports our children to be focused, gives a purposeful atmosphere. But low arousal approaches also includes um, what you do as well as the environment around you. So keeping a lower um, tone of voice, not being um, too loud, but also not being too quiet, what choice of words, not using any words that are kind of triggering or upsetting. Um, not having too much background noise, being to the point, um, not too much additional information that's not relevant to your lesson, always choosing the path of least resistance, um, which means that if there is conflict or difficulty arising, the right thing to do, the kind thing to do is to back down. This is, losing an argument to an angry, upset child is not losing losing an argument to an angry and upset child is kind and the right thing to do 
having that conversation, that difficult conversation will go much better when things are calm. Your priority in that moment is to take the path of least resistance, keep things calm, get things back on an even keel. No one learns anything while they're angry and upset. Again, like I said at the beginning, all of these strategies are about maximising every student's chance of being successful. Just that little bit more consideration of the environment, your body language, your tone, your content, to, to just try and give them every chance in the world to get it right and to be able to succeed. Next slide, please. Okay, so on Tuesday, we spoke about narrating the positive. Um, particularly useful for children with SEMH so that there's no room for making mistakes. You've been absolutely clear what the right way of doing things looks like because you're telling them and um, not giving them chance to get it wrong. This is a little bit different narrating the situation for autistic children. It may be that the struggle to recognize their own emotions we can tell children if you're getting upset, you're allowed to leave the classroom. But what if they don't recognise when they're getting upset? What if they're not able to process that? Those same children can often struggle with peer relationships and not know what the right thing to do in order to have a positive interaction with one of the classmates. So just talking through what the expectation is, noticing what they're doing and, and narrating kind of supportive narration to help them through that situation works in both of those circumstances so both for managing emotions and um, peer relationships so for example you might say I can see that you are getting frustrated and angry that's not a good feeling for you so let's have a break um, or you might say Harry you can put the worksheet near to the middle of the table so Adam can see as well that's really kind that's a really good thing to do it seems really obvious but actually I think once children get to a certain age it doesn't come naturally to us particularly speaking as a secondary school teacher it probably doesn't come as naturally to us to talk children through those things but actually a, a lot of our children need that and I think um, knowing that you understand what's what they're going through is another way to build really positive relationships as well next slide please okay again super simple but often something that doesn't come naturally to us but we have a tendency to put people's name at the end of an instruction when you've already said the instruction and they possibly weren't listening so this is a really important again really important for children with autism who may not be experiencing the sensory differences maybe that they're not experiencing sound in the same way as we are so your voice in the classroom may be less obvious than some background noise like the light buzzing or something like that really really important to say the name first but actually I would prefer it if when people speak to me they say my name first because there's nothing worse than hearing your name and then realising that someone's already said something to you. This is putting our children in a situation where they can then get something wrong or not follow an instruction and it's simply that they did not know you were speaking directly to them. So we would tend to say something like, what did you get for question one, Sarah? But actually just saying, Sarah, wait until you've got attention and then saying the instruction or the information can make a really big difference. I'm going to reiterate that I'm talking about making sure you've got their attention and not necessarily eye contact, not necessarily empty hands, because a lot of the children that benefit from this most actually don't need to have something to fiddle with or they might want to hold or click the pen. And we did cover that last in the last session on Tuesday. Um, and the eye contact thing has been talked about and talked about and talked about. You don't need to be looking someone in the eyes to be giving them attention. And eye contact can be very uncomfortable, even painful for some of our autistic children. You may need to repeat the name multiple times. You may need to change tone. You may need to move so you're in the line of vision a little bit more. But if you've got their attention before you give the instruction, then it's much more likely that they'll be able to follow that instruction and therefore be successful within your lesson. Um, next slide. I think this is over to you now, James. 
Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, lovely to see so many people back again. Um, so moving on, looking at literal language, we know it's a really um, it's quite a, a quite a common commonly known um, fact that some that many children and young people with autism struggle with ambiguous language. So a really simple way of do, of of doing that is uh, by avoiding it. You know, avoiding idioms such as things like it's raining cats and dogs. Um, that's that can be um, that's quite a, 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 a picturesque sort of phrase. Um, so trying to avoid those um, is really important. But if they appear as part of the school day, then, you know, do seize the opportunity to teach it. Um, do explain, oh, it's raining cats and dogs. That means it's raining really heavily. Um, and actually give them an opportunity to understand that, um, that idiom. Um, draw reference to body language and teach children to recognize it effectively. You know, sometimes even with, with my son, I might say, look at my face, what does my face say? Um, and I might um, over-exaggerate the, the features that are on my face for him, he's five years old. As we're, as we're starting to um, work with older children, we don't necessarily need to do that. It's about them understanding and recognizing the subtle nuances of, of body language as well. Um, but that needs to be explicitly taught. Stick to the point. Um, it might sound really silly, um, but if you are teaching about a topic, focus on that subject. Um, you know, we can be, we're, we're, we're absolute nightmares for it as teachers. We love teaching, we love sharing um, the things that we know. Um, and sometimes that can draw us off on the, onto um, a, a very different tangent, onto a very different path. Try to stay on topic, try to stay on um, onto that. And clearly that's a really important fact because it's been included twice, possibly accidentally. Um, don't keep rephrasing it. Um, don't keep rephrasing the language that you're using. Um, it's going to start the processing all over again. So if you're giving some information, give the information and pause and wait. And it feels like an age, um, but allow them the time to process the information. Do not try rephrasing that, that information straight away because all that's going to happen is the processes that are happening start again. Um, so we need to use the same language. We give it, we pause and we wait. And if we're still waiting and they're still looking at us like, oh, I, you know, I don't know what you're on about, we repeat exactly the same question, okay? And each time we do that, we remove unnecessary language so that it becomes something that is understandable. Next slide, please. Um, sensory understanding. So, um, you know, many children with autism also have uh, sensory processing needs as well. Um, being aware that pupils can be over and under sensitive to different sensory feedback is incredibly important. Um, being aware that they may well respond really, really, um, uh, they, they may well be really oversensitive to light, but in terms of sound, that, that, that doesn't really um, affect them and they're actually quite undersensitive. Um, being aware of those children's needs and it comes back to the relationship, something that Angela and Nicole have both said already, knowing the children in your classroom. Be aware of the sensory stresses and triggers for your pupils. You know, build those relationships to understand their needs and speak to them about it. Include them and speak to them. Use their voice to, to explain to you what it is they like and they dislike. Um, consider the safety factors. Allow them to have their preferred resources when appropriate. Don't um, don't deny them. Don't refuse them those those things if that's something that they need. But make sure that it's done in a safe way. Um, and you know our, our role as teachers is incredibly important to begin to prepare our children and young people for adulthood. Um, the world is an incredibly noisy place. It can be an incredibly bright place. It can be an incredibly dull place. It can be um, lots of different senses sense. Um, textures out there in the world as well. And part of our role is to actually begin to prepare them and desensitize them to those, set, to, to those sensory differences that they have. Um, you know, we're never going to get rid of them, but actually we can equip them with the opportunity to understand them, to overcome them to a point where 
it doesn't cause them to become as anxious as they have been doing. So do start to do start to desensitize them. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to throw them into a into a um, sensory situation that they really don't like. Um, we have to build it up. We have to give them lots of opportunities to do that. Um, next slide, please. Consider your sensory learning environment. So look at the immediate learning environment for your pupils. Some children, um, I am, you know, I was and still am one of them, um, are incredibly messy, have incredibly messy desks. And some children do not do not want to have um, messy desks. Actually taping um, an area of the desk off so that children with autism can understand that this is my side, you know, it's like dirty dancing. This is my space. This is your space. Um, this is my space and that's your space. And in my space, I can do what I want within reason. If it needs to be messy, then it needs to be messy. If I like it to be tidy, I'll have it tidy. If your space is messy, then that's okay because it's your space. So just be aware and support them to understand the, the immediate learning environment. Spend time in your room to better understand the noises and smells and lights, the feels of the apparatus and the furniture and the resources. We have a com conference room and one of the things that we can hear is, is you know, it, I, I'm, I'm aware of it, is the projector. When it's on, there is a very low um, sound of the air coming into it. And that's something that I pick up on. Um, now, our brains are really good at filtering out that sensory feedback. Um, but some children with autism, they find that really, really difficult. But being aware of that, being aware of the noises, smells and lights, um, that allows us to try to look at how we can support that, how we can mitigate those that sensory feedback for those children. Um, and again, it comes back to the previous slide, know the sensory preferences of your pupils, um, because that's going to help you to support them to develop it if they're undersensitive and they need that stimulus, they need that feedback, um, or uh, support them if they are oversensitive to it and they need to they need to become destimulated. Um, and consider your placement as a teacher. This is one of those that's um, incredibly incredibly um, common for is particularly children and young people as well with uh, sensory needs like um, hearing impairments and vision impairments. Knowing where we are as teachers, as adults within that room, you know, making sure that we're standing in the right place, that we're not standing um, in front of a window because we don't want to cause a shadow, that we're not standing in front of a really bright light for a learner who has sensory, sensory needs for light. We are making sure that we are considering our placement as a teacher and being aware of that. Next slide, please. Creating a, a, a sense of community and belonging is um, incredibly important. Um, you know, the world is not always a, a nice place for, for children and young people we send, and it's about us supporting our children and young people to, to understand that, but also to celebrate the fact that they have um, these amazing qualities and we need to recognize those. So normalizing the difference is really important. Everybody is different. Schools are made up of um, a vast range of um, diverse people. Um, and that's what makes the community, the, the, the people that are in the building make that up. And uh, understanding and celebrating those differences within our classes is incredibly important. And what you'll find is that children are really understanding and accepting of others' needs. Um, it's not one of those where I'm not sitting next to them because they've got special needs. They actually start to understand that and they actually start to um, feel a part of that community. That being said, we must maintain high expectations of our learners. Um, we, you know, uh, it, we see it quite often where we fall into the trap of lowering our expectations for our learners with SEND. And actually, our learners with SEND deserve exactly the same quality of education as our learners without SEND. And making sure that we maintain those high expectations, but we make our reasonable adjustments, we meet their needs in order to support them um, in, in being successful. Building relationships. Oh, could we just go back one more, sorry. Thanks. Uh, building relationships is incredibly important, and we said it in the previous um, in the previous webinar and in this one as well. Um, and it, it works for everybody. 
um, you know, use those shared habits and routines to create a sense of community in your class. It might be that you have an in joke, an in saying, a phrase that you use just in your class with those children. And it encourages the learners with autism to be into it, to be understanding um, and to feel part of a group of people because everybody's sharing in a common in a common thing. Um, and model empathy when when it's appropriate. Now it might be responsive. It might be in re in response to an incident that's happened in class or in school, or it might be as part a planned part of the curriculum. If you're delivering something in the English curriculum or the PSAG or history curriculum, anything like that can be an opportunity to plan um, the delivery of the teaching of empathy um, and for you to model that empathy as well. And don't be afraid to do that. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, homeschool relationships. Um, and Nicole talked about this and, and, and sort of stressed how important it was. Spend time to get to know the parents and carers that you've got. Um, it might sound really obvious, but an investment there can be an incredible uh, can pay off in the long run. Absolutely. Um, you know, our parents and carers are the children's first educators. They were the ones who first started teaching them. Um, so they know the differences. They know the needs. Um, sometimes they, they, they might have different perceptions to you and that's OK. It's about you working together as a team to support that child to be successful. But listen to the parents and carers. Pupils are often very different in school to how they are at home. We are, you know, how many times have we sat at parents' evening and we've talked about this model pupil in the school who is wonderful and beautiful and does everything that we absolutely want them to do. And then the parents look and go, yeah, all right. Um, and then uh, and then come out with these horrendous stories of, of things that happen when they go home. Pupils with autism may well be suppressing their needs in school because they know that they are different to their peers and they don't want to feel different. They don't want to appear different. So they look to fit in, but it creates that pressure cooker effect where the lid is fastened on and it's tightened and tightened throughout the day. And all of a sudden they go home and it explodes. So be aware of the changes in behaviors, reflect on those um, and what's going on in your class and, dis and look to see whether there's anything that you can do in school which is going to alleviate the chances of that pupil struggling at home as well. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll pick back up from here. I think it's, uh, I think obviously we speak about relationships a lot and there's some interesting suggestions about how we can, how we can maximize on how much we talk about relationships going on in the chat right now. So don't miss out, don't miss out on that. But also, I think this point about building a relationship with families is something that's often overlooked, but actually really important. And I think it is particularly important for our SEND learners because there is so often a perception in schools about difficult SEND parents or parents of children with special needs being problematic and difficult. And I think sometimes we just need to step back and remind ourselves that first of all, that is their baby. They're very vulnerable baby. And secondly, that we will probably never meet a person that's going to advocate for that child and push for that child as much as they are. So building that relationship and recognizing what may be perceived as being difficult actually is something really positive can make a really, a really big difference to the child and their needs getting met, but also everyone's well-being. And I think after 10, years ish just over 10 years of being a teacher most of that being a senko realizing that was probably one of my biggest turning points anyway i will get back on track next slide please okay so talking now about children with slcn very uh, specifically in that communication and interaction broad area of need got autism and SLCN and I think of the two it's SLCN that's a little bit more of a woolly definition and can actually include quite a broad range of different need types, lesser known, lesser understood need types and I think if anything that makes our universal offer 
even more important because these are things that are just good practice that can open up how we teach to a greater number of children and without us really having to worry about whether they've got this diagnosis or that diagnosis or exactly what that means. Um, particularly with SLCN, it's often underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed as well. So there are highly likely to be children in your class that are struggling because of SLCN, but no one has actually made that connection yet. And that may be manifesting as lack of progress. It may be manifesting as behavior. So I think these strategies, they're, they're a little bit more difficult to attach to a specific need type. I think it's human nature to like to match things up. But actually, I think if anything, these are the most important. So to start with single level instructions, <clears throat> I think um, often when we give a simple instruction, it's actually made up of multiple implied instructions and our children with uh, communication needs but also children with a learning disability will really struggle to pull out those implied instructions so just to give an example when we say write the date and title in your book what we're actually saying is know what the date and title are find them get your pen get your book find the right page by the time they've worked all that out probably by copying the people around them have they remembered what they're supposed to be doing then they're asking you that's kind of annoying and then everyone's ready to start and you've got some that inexplicably haven't started writing the date and title yet and just breaking it down into those individual instructions might feel like it's going to slow things down but actually i have always found that it speeds things up the children that know what's going on will will get on with it it's not going to stop anyone from making progress but for those children with a communication difficulty or a learning need actually just spelling it out to them enables them to be efficient and then they are able to get on with what they're supposed to be doing and probably more importantly be independent and successful alongside the peers i think as teachers and educators we've all been in that situation where we've said right everyone write the date and title you've given a little pause and then for some reason everyone's hands up what's the date what's the title shall i write it with a black pen do i need to underline it can i take my jumper off it's it's because there's so much there's so much other stuff that's kind of implied within that instruction so literally with my classes not necessarily all my classes but where i know that there are children that have this need would literally say get your pen show me your pen hold your book up yep that's your book get the right page here's the date on the board copy that and james has already mentioned the importance of pausing and if you have to give an instruction twice not rephrasing it and that absolutely applies here as well so you get your pen Give it a minute. If there's someone that doesn't have the pen, I would say pen <laughs> and maybe look at them in a more pointed way or I might pass them it. But this is all, it seems bitty, but actually it's all going to speed things up, make things more efficient and enable more children to be independent and successful. Next slide, please. Okay, a second strategy that I really love to use in um, lessons where there are children with communication difficulties speech language and communication difficulties you may have noticed that we've left all the colored bubbles up on this one because actually works really well for mld children that have maybe got adverse childhood experiences and have got less life experience less cultural knowledge and also children with sensory differences um maybe with a visual impairment this works really well for a variety of need types and actually we do this for <clears throat> we do this for our um, high attaining children as well um, like a lot of these strategies it's not going to harm anyone full disclosure this is stolen from um, reading reconsidered if you're not familiar with the reading reconsidered program i'd recommend that you google it um, really really useful stuff not just this but loads of other stuff as well so simply kind of looking ahead and thinking, right, we've got to read this text, we've got to read this worksheet, we're reading this excerpt, we're looking at this source, depending on what subject or topic you're doing, and anticipating what the words within that 
are that are going to be unfamiliar to children, that are going to need defining, that are going to be difficult for them to visualise um, and putting them, just putting them in a PowerPoint or something so that as you're reading, you can be putting the images up as well. So I've put an example on here. The sun blooms on the horizon, <clears throat> golden petals stretching ever outwards, blah, 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 blah. I won't read it to you, even though I was kind of enjoying that. Um, I would be concerned whether the children in my higher need classes would know what the horizon was. So just having an image where you can point out what that is and what that means, maybe look out of the window as well. The sun is not a thing that blooms, that's something that would need some level of explanation. Visuals can be really supportive of that. Um, matching up the kind of colours to the mood of it, throwing in some definitions, just something so you've got an anchor point, some visuals to support their understanding as you're going through. This kind of connects to the to the next slide as well, um, <clears throat> in that, you know, quite often we, we give children things to read and that might be something as simple as reading the question on a worksheet and having to infer meaning and work out what they need to answer. It doesn't have to be a long text. And we have a certain expectation on children to be able to deal with that. But being able to read, being able to decode the letters to get the right sounds doesn't mean that they've got all the cultural knowledge and the information they need to infer meaning from it and then use that meaning for something. And I know that in the previous session, James spoke in a little bit more detail about um, the importance of knowing your children's reading ages. This can be another powerful tool for um, supporting understanding for children that maybe the reading age is deviated from the chronological age and to not only support them to understand but to, to start to build up the knowledge and understanding so they can apply it in other um, situations as well. It's also really fun. I really enjoy doing this with the children because the you can see the, the pennies dropping and you can see them enjoying learning and feeling that they've made progress and got something tangible that they can take from the lesson. Uh, next slide, please. This is kind of part of the same thing and I'm going to refer back to the previous slide and also what James had said about reading ages but I would be very very cautious with classes where there are children with SLCN but also any other need type of just giving them some reading to do even if the reading age is the chronological age these are children if your year seven's reading age is the chronological age the reading age is 11 that is not very many years of reading that they've got under the belt so I would always try to put some kind of support and structure in place to help them develop those inference and comprehension skills um, if it is just a worksheet questions that they need to answer I would usually read aloud to them that comes back to dual coding from last um, the last session as well but for longer pieces um, and again a lot of this is taken from reading reconsidered um, there's a few different things that you can do to support that understanding. So I often give them the text and ask them to read through it on their own, circling or highlighting words that they don't understand. You can even ask them to highlight words that they find interesting and they may be more likely to share with you that way if it doesn't feel like a negative. Um, you can usually predict what they're going to highlight. So you could have your images ready from the previous slide. Um, but then once you've kind of got them highlighted, it's an opportunity to maybe get some class feedback, ask them what they've highlighted, discuss some of the meanings and things like that. I would then do a second read through as a group um, and discuss meaning again. So it might be that after they've read it independently, you ask them to write a sentence or to, to say something to you to tell you what it means. And then after you've looked at some definitions and images and done a second read through, you can ask them the same question again. And it's a really tangible way of seeing if their understanding of it has developed now that they've got more context, more visuals and more understanding. And the difference between the first read through and what they infer from it in the second read through can be really stark. That's a really good opportunity. It's a platform then to provide positive feedback and say, oh, well, the first time you read it, you said it's just about a sunset 
and this second time you've told me all about how the sun coming up and the light unfurling is like a flower blooming it's really tangible um progress and that builds confidence and makes the children feel good about themselves and coming to your lesson and themselves as learners so there's all them underlying benefits um, to be had as well next slide please um i think again something that's often um overlooked when we're talking about communication is that the children need channels of communication back to you so that they can participate and also so that they can seek support i think it's um easy to assume that a child with autism or maybe a child with a with a, a speech difference or something like selective mutism doesn't want to participate but i would be reluctant to assert that i imagine that they probably do want to participate again that would come down to relationships and knowing your children i would never put a child on the spot um, especially if they already had a speech language and communication difficulty but i would always want to provide them with opportunities to take part um, that can be really tricky and knowing you know conversation with the senko and things like that it can it, we, we're kind of getting into additional and different territory but there are still things that you can do that can just be available in your class that open up those opportunities to communicate absolutely those children need to be able to tell you if they need a wee or they feel sick or they're going to cry um and all them other annoying things that children do um but this is i think this is more about offering opportunities for them to be part of the class and participate in the lesson and interact with the peers so dixon's trinity in my own school we have prisms little wooden blocks on every single desk um that has a red side a yellow side but we call it amber and a green side and the child there's lots of different ways we use them but a child can turn it to a different color to get the teacher's attention without having to put the hand up they are not allowed to put the hands up that is not something that happens um turn it to red or amber to get the teacher to come to them very subtle um and used universally throughout the school so so very consistent um, I know some schools use little passes. Um, it reminds me of, I don't know if anyone's had the good luck of being able to eat at Fazenda in Leeds, where you put a little green card on your table and they just keep bringing you meat on swords. It's a little bit like that. And then when you've had enough sword meat, you can turn it back to red and they'll stop bothering you. Um, for some of our children that find communication difficult, it might be that they could have a little a similar system where they have a card on the desk and you can see, oh, they've turned it to green. That means that they need more beef or they need to ask me something, they need to go to the toilet or they need to check something to do with the work. Um, again, we have mini whiteboards at every table, so they might write the answers on a whiteboard and hold it up. Um, but actually, a lot of this is overcomplicating the situation it could just be as simple as once everyone's got on with the task that you go and have a one-to-one -one conversation with that child so they don't have to worry about putting themselves on the spot but they can tell you what they wanted to say they can give you their answers and you can give them that personal live feedback um, in a way that is comfortable for them next slide please this is me as well um so smart displays that's probably over egging it a little bit it doesn't have to be anything too fancy but just thinking about the way you're using the wall space in your classroom and then maximizing on that for the children that need it most um it's easier in some subjects than other subjects so um it's really really difficult to tell but i'm actually a geography teacher i can't remember the last time i taught anyone any geography but I am a geography teacher um, and the, there's some obvious things that you can put on the wall that you can then refer back to maps um, and stuff like that flags maybe that you can then um, use to refer to in the lessons that are literacy based sentence structures sentence starters um, <clears throat> 
things that you can kind of point to for the children as reminders of those common things that come up time and time again um, can be really useful. And then you can strategically seat your children um, in relation to those displays so that um, they can use it in a subtle way without having to get up and move around. Um, I would always keep them simple and purposeful. You can have interactive displays that maybe have resources attached that children can go and pick up and take back to the seats. Um, but I don't think it really has to be that fancy. Um, I've just seen pop up in the chat that this could affect children's kind of um, cognitive load. I think we have to be really careful about balance. We don't want to not provide things for children because we're worried about overloading them. And I stick by what I said kind of earlier in this session and in the previous session, low arousal, kind of calm, purposeful, um, uncluttered environment and approach is usually what the children need. And that actually opens up the opportunity to have displays that uh, are noticeable. So if you've got piles of stuff everywhere in your classroom and a million things on the wall, then an active display is possibly going to overload a child. But if you've got a nice, plain, simple classroom, there's nothing up there that you're not going to use. There's nothing there that's not relevant to what's happening. Having a really well thought out, purposeful, clear display that you can refer to um and use as part of your lessons i think would probably be fine it's going to be different for different children and it definitely has to be really carefully thought out and balanced but i would say that having decent displays and low arousal approaches are not um, necessarily in conflict with each other if done well next slide please over to you james Super, thank you. Don't know about anybody else, but I struggled to concentrate after you talked about meat on a sword at Fazenda. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and now that's where I want to go when lockdown's over. Um, I recommend. <laughs> so, um, thinking about word banks now, children with um, speech, language, and communication needs. Word banks are really good for those learners who struggle with both expressive and um, and receptive language. Um, because it allows them to have an anchor of vocabulary, a trusted source of vocabulary that they can go to, that they can use in different contexts. And we as practitioners can support them in developing their own versions of these. And that's one of the key, key sort of important things of, of a word bank is that really the best ones are the ones that are child led um, and that they develop themselves um, with you. So we can start to actually group language into different categories. So we might have adjectives, we might have requests like toilet, um, like drink, like food um, or help. We might ha just have conversational language like how are you? And we can present these in different ways depending on the needs of the child um, and the complexity of their speech, language and communication needs. We may well use symbol related um, text as well. Um, but we might not need to do that. And again, it comes down to, I know that there's that there's now a game going on in the chat, it comes down to the relationships that you have with the children and understanding, um, understanding what it is that they need um, and promote those semantic links as well. Um, and word banks can also encourage the acquisition of language because it allows them to see the links between that, that word means the same as that or is, is it within the same category so it allows us to explore and learn new language as we go along and they're really simple you know a little book a little piece of paper on the on the table next to the student or in their book um, it could be photocopied in, in the front of their book and stuck in um, something really easy that they can that they can use to navigate um, communication next slide please So when we're talking about task organizers, um, we're going to look at how we organize tasks by color, by shape, any category really, it could be animals. We're not fussed on how we do it. We just need to make sure that there is an organization structure to it. So it may well be that we present quick starter tasks always in blue. So um, if uh, if you're using the, um, the 
um, arrival slide, like Nicole suggested, um, if you're using that and you're providing them with a quick do now task on the table, then actually all do now tasks are done with, a, a, are printed with a blue border on them. So that the per ch child or young person knows that when they come into that room, they do that independently. That's the first task that they, that they get on with. And it allows them to uh, that they don't need to rely on your verbal instructions anymore. They don't need to. They don't need to wait until you give them the instruction of sit down, get your do now task, get your pencil, start your work. Because actually, they they've uh, that there's a routine involved that's been taught and encouraged so that they're able to be more independent with that. Using visual organisations such as Venn diagrams um, and mind maps and things can help to support. Um, the understanding of, of topics um, and concepts as we're going through. And it removes some of the um, unnecessary language that, that, um, that, that can sometimes be in, be in worksheets, et cetera, that we provide our students with. Um, so use those simple organizational structures. I know that I talked to the other day about task ladders, um, really simple visual structures if we're giving them a if we're giving them a job if we're giving them a, an activity to do um and where there's repeated steps that they need to go to or success criteria we can provide them with a task ladder that has that on and they can tick it off as they're going so that they're able to achieve that and they know what they're doing in those easy to follow steps next slide please um proportionate responses is um is a really important one um, it can be incredibly frustrating for um, a child or a young person with speech, language and communication needs um, because communicating is, is hard, you know, by its very nature. Um, and what we can fall into, into the danger of is um, when a child successfully um, communicates with us, celebrating that outwardly um, and often that can, that be, that can be quite off-putting for, for a child or young person. You know, we don't need to we don't need to um, remind them of the fact that they struggle to communicate and that well done, you've been successful, because actually that's something that they're that they're aware of. So when we say about when we reward our students with children, with speech, language and communication needs, the reward is by our appropriate response to them. So if they ask us a question, we respond to them appropriately. And that is the reward that they get. That is how they know that they've communicated effectively. They certainly don't need that public um, public celebration, um, jumping up and down. We might do it in private, it might be break time and they've gone out to break. And then afterwards we look at other adults in the room and we um, or we, we go to our neighbor next door and we say, oh my God, you will not believe what, uh, what Jeff just what Jeff just did and celebrate it there but don't don't do it in front of the child um, unless unless you have a relationship with that pupil but again I would still I still feel that it comes down to doing that privately so you know when they've set when you've set them off on the task going over to them and saying I really liked um, I really liked that answer well done um, and celebrating the answer that they gave not the effort that they had to apply to actually give that answer um, give the give children and young people enough time to speak. Um, I I know somebody who has a speech and language need, and the way that they refer to it is that they they store it in their brain. Every time they struggle with a certain sound or a certain word, they store it in their brain, and it creates a level of anxiety um, when they're when they're going to say when they know that they're coming up against that same word or same sound in the future, um, and they will avoid it which is not necessarily a great strategy and speech and language therapists would tell would tell uh, would tell him off for doing that um, they either avoid it or they create the circumstances so that they run into that word or sound um, so we must give them enough time to actually say what they have to say um, out, you know they are very aware of what our faces are saying um, so do try to avoid the waiting for them to get that sound out um, because you know it is it can be quite rude um, so do try to avoid doing that um, another way of supporting them is modeling the sentence back to them so if they say a sentence to you wasn't quite clear but you understood what they wanted to say model that sentence back to them and say you want to go to the toilet of course that's okay um, and give them the opportunity to hear that sentence properly and fluently 
um, so that they are able to prepare, prepare for that the next time. Next slide, please. Visual information um, is incredibly important, and you'll see that it's um, got all of the um, all of the blobs at the top. Um, it's one of those that is that is there for everybody. Um, so do provide visuals that that can lead and improve to that can improve and lead to further independence um, providing total communication using our bodies as a form of communication through gesture and facial expression visual prompts can support understanding you know it comes back to what is my face saying we're very good at communicating and i think there's something that something like 80 percent of how we communicate is done through our bodies um, so use that to our advantage when we are wanting to convey convey a piece of information, um, but also visual prompts. And generally, those visual prompts should really be on the table with the child or young person to support them. Um, highlight key vocabulary. That's an easy, a really easy way. And I know that Nicole did it in the um, uh, image image. Um, image reading uh, strategy that she talked about earlier, um, highlighting the vocabulary that we're gonna talk about and teaching it explicitly can have a huge impact. Um, and again, we talked about it in the, in the um, uh, webinar on Tuesday about pre-teaching that vocabulary. It allows them to be, uh, to, it, to be exposed to that language in a non-threatening way and to be taught it. Now, we don't necessarily need to single that out, single those children out with it that we know have got speech and language needs. If we do it universally and we explicitly teach, we highlight the key vocabulary and we teach what it is to all of the children and young people in the class, it's going to have a positive impact collectively, not just on that one person. Um, and use mind maps to collate information into key categories when we're actually organizing um, uh, organizing the work, organizing topics, um, then that's a really important way, really easy way of us collecting that information. Um, and again, limited, limiting the amount of language that is needed in order to interpret that. Next slide, please. Um, processing time. So we've talked already about processing time, but this is just to go into it a little bit more different into it. Uh, in a little bit more detail. So processing time is the period between somebody receiving information and interpreting it to understand what to do next. Um, you know, pupils with speech, language and communication needs, if they struggle with receptive language, they may require more time in order to process the information and respond appropriately. Um, so take your time, avoid filling the awkward silences that, that are happening in classes. Um, and avoid, again, avoid rephrasing questions um, or the information. So make sure that we speak, we wait, we repeat, we wait, we repeat again and wait, and then we repeat with limited language if we need to. Next slide, please. There we go, super. You're on mute, Angela. I'm on mute, sorry, I do apologise. Thank you both so much, that's fantastic. And looking at the uh, sort of the energy that's in the chat, it sounds like people have been really sort of enthused by some of the strategies that you've been able to share tonight. We've actually had some great questions come in. So we've got just about 15 minutes and we're gonna dedicate ourselves now to going through all of them. So the first question we had in was from Conrad, and he said that a lot of the language around return to school has been around catching up, learning loss, etc. And there's been a lot less about re-socialization, re-regulation of our vulnerable learners and getting them back into school. So what would our advice be to avoid any pitfalls? So I'm just gonna start off by saying, one of the things that we've talked about in our trust is about transforming our curriculum and transformational curriculum. So it's not recovery, it's about doing things differently. And so there's a little sort of um, expression and you've got to be careful which way around you put the letters, but I think it spells kids. But if you, if you, you get your letters jumbled up, it can spell something else. So for kids, it's keep, improve, ditch and stop. And so for the keep things, it's as we look at that curriculum, what are the things we'd really like to keep? 
you know, sort of are these things we're really enjoying doing and the children are getting lots out of it and having real impact, we'll keep those. Anything that, that doesn't actually have any impact, we're going to ditch it and we're going to sort of improve on the things where we can see that they're having sort of impact and progress and we're just going to absolutely stop doing anything which is having no impact whatsoever. So if we just get sort of our heads around this concept, it's transformation, it's doing things differently and putting children's mental health and well-being first. There's some fantastic resources on the Nason Gateway which can really support around COVID return, um, which I think would be really useful to flag to people. Would uh, either Nicole or James want to pop in and say anything in answer to that question? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Obviously, this is a hot topic at the minute and the government will be the government and they'll tell us what they think is the right thing. But actually, what are we behind on all of the children and all of society has been in the same situation? In fact, the whole world has been in the same situation. We set the curriculum. Being agile and responsive and meeting our children's needs is what we do. That's what that's what being a teacher is. And then they may not understand that. And they can talk about catch up all they want. But all I want is my kids back in front of me. So I can work out where they're all at and make progress from there. That's what we're doing anyway. It's a little bit more complex, but it's no different to, to what every situation everyone's in. Thank you. Um, Alistair's asked a question about have we any strategies or suggestions that work really well for supporting families in the wider community to have raised aspirations and expectations for our pupils. And again, I'd be saying the first thing is visibility. One of the biggest problems for children and young people with SEND is they're not visible enough within their communities. So, you know, everything you can do to promote young people with SEND in your schools is really important. And just things like having a look at your website, and looking at what sort of messages do you share about learners who do have additional needs and is there something you could be doing around that often the progress learners with send make is actually better than that of their peers is that really obvious and do people know that when they look at the the sort of information you're sharing and also you know on a class level are you celebrating the progress that those learners with more needs are making so again uh, james do you want to pop in and say anything around that yeah, um, I think it, it just comes down to, you know, when you're when you're speaking to parents and carers, like you said, celebrate it, but maintaining those high expectations as well um, and not allowing not allowing the community as a school um, and the wider community, including the families as well, to fall into those pitfalls of um, of having low aspirations for, for children, and young people with SEND as well. OK, we've got a question from uh, Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine has a student with ASD and selective mutism. How can she bring him out of his shell? He's becoming a school refuser, which is um, unfortunately not uncommon. And um, especially remotely, he's not engaging. Mum's at a wit's end. How do I support her the, uh, the best also? So can I just ask Nicole to pop in with an answer for that one? Yeah, we've been in a similar situation, actually. We've got a... a lovely year 10 girl that's autistic and selective mute mute and some of the strategies that i've spoke about today work really well for her, keeping everything very routines based calm and low arousal uncluttered she knows what she's doing um it's not really about the routines of it and it's not really about i suppose it's about anxiety but i think the thing that you're trying to build is trust that when the, a child with high anxiety or the, the needs that we've described comes into school, the need to be able to trust that what they think is going to happen is what is going to happen, that it's going to be the right people, the, the, the right routines. And once you've built that trust, you've got a really strong foundation for, for everything else that needs to happen. I think in this specific situation, because of lockdown, small steps and building on those small successes is going to be really, really important. It's going to be different for different children. My girl in, in a similar situation, actually, I think she'll just come back. I think all she wants is to be back in that routine. And it's the fact that it's different now that's the problem. But that's not going to be the same for everyone. So we'll be starting with those really small steps, building real trust by being really consistent and taking and, and taking it from there. Thanks very much. OK, we've got um, a question from Rachel Walford, who is asking about structured conversations from Achievement for All and would we recommend this strategy? Um, I don't know whether anyone in particular wants to come in and, and make a response to that.
James? Um, I, I've, I've not worked with, uh, with structured conversations um, from Achievement for All uh, personally, but um, having those, having those um, I, I'm assuming it's almost like rehearsed, rehearsed conversations and, and practice uh, role play so social situations. Um, of course, that's, re that's a really good sort of strategy to use with, with children and young people with autism and with speech and language needs because it allows them to rehearse um, what's going to happen, the language that they're going to need, um, and the appropriate responses that they're going to give to those. So anything that allows children, young people to rehearse the language and communication before they go into it um, is, is key, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a DfE resource that was sort of created. So, you know, and I'm sure one of my key things around any intervention that you're looking to use is try to research what the impact is. Because if you're removing children and young people from the mainstream education of what's going on, you need to know that what you're doing is going to be really impactful. So any learning they might be missing out on um, is actually caught up by the fact they're going to make so much progress with the new sort of programme they're on. So all interventions, do your research, make sure they're evidence led and make sure that they've got real impact that will actually help your young people. Um, next question I've got here um, is how would we reintegrate vulnerable SEND learners back into the routine of school? Would we place them back in immediate routine to create a sense of familiarity or would we introduce them back into the routine more gradually? This is a question from Kirsty Campbell. I would absolutely go for it, yeah, get them straight back into routine. You know, sort of the sooner we start with the, the regular routines, the sooner they become just that, more routine, and the children feel safe. So, you know, I'd actually sort of if you can send stuff out beforehand not that we've got much time before the eighth which prepare and, and the young person can work with their family at home to know that they will be coming back into the normal routine for some young people that will reduce anxiety would anyone else like to add anything to that only to i 100 percent agree and i think if you're in a situation where that seems like it's not going to work it's a good opportunity to look at those routines and see how you can make them more inclusive I'm, I would want all of my SEN learners and vulnerable learners to be straight back in routine as soon as they're back in school because I already know that we've designed those routines carefully to include those children. Fantastic, thank you. We've had a question from um, somebody teaching A-levels, which is wonderful to know that we're covering this fan because we had an early years uh, teacher contribute in the chat earlier, um, saying that teaching in the secondary sector and at A-level, the opportunities to build relationships with parents are limited. So in her current role, um, all communication tends to be sort of through the head of year. So it's that third party conversation. Any creative tips on how to find opportunities to build on these relationships? Nicole, would you like to come in on that one? That, to me, that feels like a conversation with the decision makers within your own school. Because if, the, if you're finding that limiting in something that you want to do, I don't necessarily think that you need to go and, and upset the apple cart if that's an established routine, but just exploring maybe what would be appropriate, maybe a note in the planner, an email, something that's not gonna be disruptive, but is gonna open up that channel because it really, it, I don't think it matters whether it's a four-year-old or a 17-year-old, having that three-way partnership between the student, the school and the family, it's a game changer really. Okay, thank you. We've got a question from uh, Samantha Barnard, who uh, is talking about parent care relationships also, um, and about the, the management of a situation where a parent is in denial about their child's learning needs. So mum is positive, her child's developmental age is appropriate, um, although that's not the feeling of the school, and this is a reception age child. Um, I think that that is very, very common, and anybody who's had any experience of working in a special school will tell you that that is possibly one of the most common situations you find yourself in with parents. And I think sometimes it's working with the parent to reach that realisation and just giving them time to accept, because this is a form of bereavement for that parent. This is not what they signed up for. They thought they were getting a child who was going to be typically development, developing and perfect in their eyes and you know their child is not making the progress. So I think building the relationship with the parent, taking the time to do that, understanding and helping them celebrate everything that's good about their child and, and making it as positive as you can. 
is, is really my advice there. Would anyone else like to add to that? Yeah, I, I saw something on Twitter actually um, that was there was a picture and it said um, conversation conversations with send parents should always start like this and it was um, you know we're going to talk about your child today and a, and a lot of the conversation is going to be about things that they can't do um, but I just want to highlight the things that they can do and really to to shine a, shine a light on those. Um, but do it alongside the parents, support them, support them to do it, um, is, is really key, as Angela said. Thank you for that. Um, we've had an anonymous attendee has asked us about our view on widgets to support learners with reading. I'm assuming we're talking about communicating print, also known as writing with symbols. Um, th there's absolutely no, no problem with using symbols to support reading, um, you know, as long as you're using a recognised sort of uh, symbol provider, which, you know, widget is. Um, the important thing is to make sure you always have the text there, because the ambition should be for children to become readers of text, and therefore having the symbol there, and gradually over time you can fade the symbols and make them smaller and smaller and make the writing bigger, so that that connection between the word and the picture is cemented in the, in the learner's mind. Um, next one is another anonymous attendee, uh, maybe the same one, I'm not sure. Uh, would you suggest, sorry, what would you suggest for those learners who have good understanding of text and can verbalise it, but cannot physically write it down due to other areas of need? I am flying through these, I know, because we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I would say, you know, go for an alternative recording method. You, know, you want children and young people to be able to record that excitement that they have about text and therefore, you know, sort of this is additional to and different from these children should be on sense support, in which case you can bring in alternative methods of recording. Anybody want to add anything to that before we move to the next question? I think because we're in the domain of um, universal offer, sometimes it is just a sim as simple as letting them choose from a selection of answers or give a verbal answer as long as there is also opportunities to write and develop writing skill. Additional and different could include things like clicker 8 and um, having an iPad or a recording device or something like that um, and knowing which of those options you need to go to will always come back to get your drinks ready for the drinking game, relationships. Um, we've had a question from, from Jenna um, for class communication. Would you recommend using lolly sticks with students' name on and randomly picking them for their input or would send students feel picked on? I think it's dangerous if it really is random. I notice you've put your random in quotes, which suggests it's not as random as, as it sounds. Um, if you know your class really well and you feel that'll work and you know you can target an appropriate question to an appropriate child and it's going to work then that would be great but you know if you don't I'd avoid it and go with the prison model that, that uh, Nicole suggested where children and young people can actually decide on today how they feel and how much they would like to um, contribute. Anybody else want to come in on that one? We actually have lolly sticks as well I think they have a they have a place I think there are times when you can choose children at random, but it's not necessarily for learning q and I think you're better to use targeted questions. I use my lolly sticks to make the children think I've got magical powers. I say, oh, I hope this is so-and-so, and then I pull it out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it is, and then put it back in. Just gives me that kind of sense of power over them that I need. And we've, the last three aren't, aren't necessarily questions in themselves, but there's some lovely affirmation in here, so I'm going to share it. Um, that we've had Sue Fox saying that she uses uh, James's coloured slides as well. She used them for years and they work really well. So thanks for that, Sue. We've had Helen Hebert, who says that she's always advocated for experiential learning for uh, students with speech language communication needs. Do we agree? Absolutely. Experiential learning works fantastically for everybody and the more we can incorporate it into the way we teach the better. And we've also got Jill Williams who has said um, that they use the structured conversations not only in AFA but they also have adopted them for their parental meetings which again sounds like excellent advice. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. It's been a delight. You've been a wonderful audience. Nicole and, and James are have been absolutely superb and you know I'm very proud I feel like a proud parent to, to have heard them over the last two days sharing some really practical solutions which hopefully will help you through the, the difficult weeks and months ahead so thank you so much. <laughs>